we are going to be exploring uh, the value proposition of Filecoin and decentralized storage as it relates to uh, journalism and publishing. And with that, we have uh, Bailey Reutzel, who is going to be hosting this session. She is a longtime crypto journalist um, and uh, event producer. And we also have Chris Garcia of the Protocol Lab storage provider team. And we also have Cami Russo, who is the uh, longtime crypto journalist and the founder of The Defiant, uh, who will be coming in remotely. Uh, so with that, I would like to turn it over to Bailey. Hey, Cami. Um, so we, we have Cami here virtually. Cami Russo is the co founder and CEO of The Defiant, which is a news publication that writes about DeFi, crypto, and blockchain. Also here with me is Chris Garcia from Protocol Labs. I'm gonna start, we're gonna talk about not fake news publishing with blockchain. I'm gonna start with an introduction of myself so you know why I'm here. My name's Bailey Reitzel. I'm a longtime crypto journalist. So I started writing about Bitcoin in 2012. Um, and over the years, I have lost quite a bit of articles and videos and audio, all because of the degradation of the internet and you know bad website updates, basically. So I lost a bunch of that data, and that's my resume. So that actually really hurts me as I'm applying for other jobs or just generally trying to remember, um, remember my time in journalism and crypto. And so that's why I'm here. I wanted to start by asking Cami why she's here as well, because I know you covered markets in Argentina for some time, and so I think that economic turmoil that was in Argentina is a big reason why you're here today. So Cami, why don't you start off with that? Uh, yeah. oh, can you Sorry, go, go ahead, Cami. Yeah. in person, but, but I could still make it uh, virtually. So yeah, I, like Bailey, um, started kind of uh, paying attention to crypto and writing about it uh, pretty early on. Uh, first story was uh, in 2013 uh, for Bloomberg in Argentina. I was there covering uh, markets at the time, um, and uh, that's how I got into crypto, kind of uh, seeing the effects of inflation and currency controls on people's uh, savings and investments. Um, covering uh, all of that situation for Bloomberg, but also kind of living it uh, myself as I was uh, earning my own salary in um, Argentine pesos. Um, so um, from kind of taking that to journalism and the importance of uh, decentralized publishing, um, I think uh, it's, it's really important, like Bailey was saying, for journalists to be able to reliably keep their work uh, online um, and, and stored and, and not kind of rely on uh, publishers uh, keeping them online because, you know, like uh, journalists, especially in a new industry like crypto, you know, we'll work on a, a upstart publishers that may not always kind of live through, uh, through time. So, so that's an important point. But uh, going back to kind of um, censorship uh, in places like uh, Argentina, where uh, in Argentina's case, it was specifically with people's money. Uh, but in other places, places it happens with uh, information and people's access to information. Uh, so, you know, places like Russia, places like China, like Venezuela, the government is dictating what information people can and cannot consume. So, for uh, places like these, it's especially important to be able to um, keep uh, a, uh, a decentralized censorship resistant means uh, of, of publishing. So uh, as kind of a founder and CEO of a, a publication covering uh, crypto and Web3, I'm super interested to learn uh, how that can be done. You know, like I'm, I'm just like personally interested in making sure that the, the important information we publish will be accessible to those that need it the most in places where information is uh, being censored. 
Yeah, absolutely. So Chris, I'm going to hand it over to you to sort of talk about what you've seen um, from the wider audience, but also from journalists and publishers in terms of why they would want to host their, their content on IPFS and Filecoin. Yeah, I think from uh, a creator's perspective, whether you're uh, creating uh, music, videos, articles, blogs, um, the ownership of that content, is, uh, the integrity of it, I should say, is important to to store to make sure that it is not um, edited. And uh, I think that being able to store those types of content on the Filecoin network, for instance, if it were to be edited by anyone, a new copy would be made and uh, we would be able to see and verify and through audit trails, you know, how those things may have changed. So it's important for um, journalists in particular, I think, like Cami was saying, for the preservation of stories that are actually happening in real life, that uh, they're not um, edited for someone's other mo motivations to maybe for their own benefit to change it, right? And so journalists in particular, uh, I think you take advantage of that through this network. Yeah, that's really interesting. I follow this Twitter bot on, um, it's the New York Times headline Twitter bot. Some of you probably also follow it. But basically every time the New York Times changes their headline or the URL of the story, it tweets out about it and just tells you what they changed. And it's actually super fascinating to see that. You know, it's not necessarily nefarious why they're changing the headline. It's usually just to try and appeal to different audiences or what's working that day versus what's not. Um, but I, I look at IPFS and Filecoin as sort of a way, a way to make sure you can see those changes throughout the whole article as well. So I guess um, for, for maybe people here who don't know, um, talk a little bit about how that system works in terms of, okay, if I publish this article on IPFS, why can't I change it? Or if I change it, what happens? Yeah, you, you can definitely change it, right? Um, but change it from the perspective of having a new version of it. The original version you upload is still going to be there. And so if you decide to change, uh, even if it's a, a, a you know benign kind of change, maybe editing a misspelling or something, that'll store a new copy. And then we can that creates an auto trail where we can see the version one, version two, version three, and so on and so forth, right? Um, but if the, but if contextually, if they want to change something that they were trying to say originally, um, maybe over time you can also see uh, and possibly discern motivations for why they were changing. You know, that brings up other 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 questions to ask of that of the original creator of the, of those works. Yeah, right, Cami. I want to kind of pass that question to you as well. First of all, like what articles on the Defiant do you think are ripe for adding to IPFS? Because maybe they're contentious um, with, within the community, within the crypto community or more broadly. And then are there, um, do you have hesitations as well about, okay, I have to put this stuff on the blockchain, which means it can't really be changed. Or if it is changed, there's this audit trail. So two part question there, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Um, so I would love to have the Defiant Manifesto uh, uploaded to uh, uh, Filecoin and IPFS. You know, it's kind of our, you know, our values, our foundational document, and it's something that I would want to live on uh, for kind of forever. Um, so I'd be excited to see that. Um, in terms of uh, kind of changing uh, versions of, uh, of articles, you know, it's, I think, I think that uh, it's good to be held accountable that way. Uh, and, and publishers should not be afraid uh, to do that. Uh, I think, you know, the, the way, the correct way to, to do it in kind of Web2 publishing is to be very diligent in uh, saying when an article has been updated and corrected. And we do that at the Defined, we add to kind of the, the end of the story, this was updated at whatever time and date to add whatever. Um, but it's true that even if we do add that note at the bottom of the story, the original version is lost. And so users uh, or, or our audience can't really kind of go back and kind of check what the original version was. Um, and I think it's fair that, that they should if they wanted to. Uh, so I think, you know, it, it just, puts uh, additional pressure on journalists, editors, and, and publishers to be careful uh, that what they're publishing is um, as, as accurate and sound um, as it should be. 
Yeah, it's kind of like a Google Doc re revision history, which I love to look through, actually. <laughs> so I like that. It kind of, I, the, the other question I want to ask with that is, what needs to be on chain and what doesn't? So maybe not every misspelling needs to go on chain. So Chris, I'm going to pass this to you. Like, in your mind, what does and doesn't uh, need to go on chain for yeah. I, with IPFS and Filecoin. Yeah, I, I, a lot of that's going to depend on the ecosystem and what they find uh, and deem as valuable to being a added to the network. Right? I think we were talking beforehand off stage about maybe um, the latest and greatest news on Kim Kardashian may not need to be stored on chain, right? But um, things that are happening right now, that in fact that Jonathan Doten, who's going to be speaking later on today, um, uh, the atrocities that are happening in, in Ukraine, for instance, right? That's something that's important for his historical purposes. That definitely needs to be on chain. That definitely needs to be something that we need to preserve uh, as a society. And so I think um, I think that's that's probably where the the, the line will fall. You know, between, um, uh, but ultimately it's going to be dependent upon the ecosystem to decide what's valuable and, and what's and what's not. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I have I have made this point as well at other Filecoin events. It's just like, you know, should Kim Car who who's Kim Kardashian's boyfriend is, should that be posted on chain? You know, some people might say that that is very valuable information that sort of speaks to our culture. And maybe that's true. So it's like, you know, the ecosystem acts as the gatekeeper. And in my mind, that's better than one person, like a publisher acting as a gatekeeper for what information is important and what information is not. Um, Chris, we also talked about off stage um, how you use IPFS, so you've also stored stuff. In yeah. case people in the audience are not journalists, maybe they're interested in why they would want to use IPFS. Yeah, I, I use Chainsafe um, to store some of our you know, more family-related type of documents. Um, one of the most recent examples, my daughter did a, uh, a PowerPoint presentation of some his from history, right? Uh, I, I think it was Civil War. Um, and so we just threw it out there and, and onto the onto Chainsafe, and it's very easy upload. Just a, a good, nice, easy to use GUI, um, and you know within seconds I got um, her her presentation, you know, preserved on IPFS network. And we do that for other things too, right? Other any Excel spreadsheets that we want to track our budget on or whatever, right? We use it for that. We don't use it at this point for photographs, but we easily could. We could put for, photographs. For photographs, up. You absolutely, said? yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah, I could see that because you also lose so much um, when social media sites go down. So I think MySpace is probably a pretty good example. I wasn't on MySpace a huge amount, but a lot of people lost a lot of their pictures and music. Um, <laughs> I also am like, oh, did I just like t tell everybody my age basically by saying I was on MySpace, but not, I'm right in that middle area. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I guess, with social media and the pictures that are on your phone, it's like we take a bunch of pictures and then we sort of lose them as we update our phones or move on to different social media platforms. So I guess, talk about that. Have you heard a lot of people sort of trying to store their most valuable information, like their Instagram pictures on IPFS? I have not heard of that. I'm, 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 I'm sure it could be done because I know when I upload a, a photograph to Instagram, right, I get a copy of that that I could then upload into IPFS, right? Um, <clears throat> but uh, we historically, in our family at least, have leveraged a lot of iCloud, Apple products, right? And so, if we ever stop paying Apple for that, you know, the 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 fate of all that data, of all our movies that we have on the Apple Apple TV, right, at library, you know, we're not going to be able to, to use those kind of things, right? Because we're not paying Apple anymore. So, that's that's the, that's the scary part about all of it. it. Having too much reliance on on one centralized storage provider. Right, exactly. Cami, I wanted to pose that question to you as well. Are there things over your journalistic period that you've lost um, because sites have gone down or, yeah? Um, well, I mean, most of my uh, journalism career was at Bloomberg, so luckily Bloomberg hasn't gone down and <laughs> my articles are still there. Um, I'll say though that it's, it's ironic that um, at at some point, like now I do have like a, a, a Bloomberg subscription, but I remember like at some point kind of not being able to see my own stories, like after I left Bloomberg to kind of finish my book. I was like, oh, like I just actually just like needed my own stories for just like research and you know, stuff I was writing about crypto. I was like, I, I remember writing this for Bloomberg, like let me go check my story. And then I wasn't able to because like I was like locked out of the paywall. <laughs> it's like, but it's my story, like I should be able to access it. Um, so that's kind of the that experience I, I had with that. Which I guess like 
a question for uh, yeah for Chris like what happens then uh, like will publishers be able to have a, a paywall if everything is on a public blockchain? Sorry, I couldn't quite hear the question. So, well, publishers, um, publishers that have a paywall that are storing to IPFS, like how does that mechanism work for them being able to store on a decentralized sort of public outlet, but also want to take in revenue from subscriptions? So if, if publishers were storing on behalf of their journalists, um, the, I right. mean, they, they still have access as, as the original creator of that document, right? Um, I think you could still... Uh, claim ownership because you're the ones that, well maybe she didn't upload it, right? She's saying the publisher uploaded it? Yeah, so I guess there, there's that mechanism of, of the journalist and the publisher. So what she's saying is at Bloomberg, after she left Bloomberg, um, you know, she wasn't able to get to some of her articles. And I actually had the same experience at American Banker, where I left American Banker, and then the articles that I wrote went behind a paywall, and so I couldn't, you know, again, I can't access them for my own records even though I wrote the thing. Um, and so there's that, there's this mechanism that maybe we haven't thought through. And there, there's maybe not a, re a good answer to this right now, but it's like, okay, publishers post to IPFS, but they also need to paywall that information for their subscriber base. And yeah. Yeah, but Kakami, as the original, as the original creator of that article, you you could still go and get that article and do, make your edits um, beyond, well beyond what Bloomberg uh, posted and post the. Uh, Camila's version, right, uh, of that article, and said this is the original work by her, not by not by Bloomberg necessarily. And we we as the audience of that can 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 definitely say yes, this is this is the person that created, it, even though she no longer works for Bloomberg, um, it's still her her work. Yeah, that's an interesting point because it, it basically means that we have to empower journalists to upload their own stuff. So instead of like publishers only being the people to upload, the journalists also have to do that. Um, yeah, okay. I'm, I'm trying to think through that process because it's a really good point that you just can't access your own stuff. Um, okay, so to sort of pull back a little bit, and I guess on the same topic, what are some of the, um, what are some of the programs and applications that currently exist in the Filecoin and IPFS ecosystem that are easy to use for just, you know, a noob or a journalist? Yeah, so, so I, like I said earlier, I use Chainsafe. Um, I think you said you use Slate. I use Slate. Uh, yeah, yeah, Slate. Um, and I've never used Slate, but I'm sure it has like a awesome GUI that you can just you know click and drag or uh, upload your files. I'm sure it's super fast, right? Um, and then you go retrieve them, just like just like a Dropbox, I guess is the best way uh, to probably explain it or best thing that's most uh, like it. So yeah, I'm, I'm very familiar with Chainsafe, um, but I think um, and we were going to do a Slate uh, demonstration, but we're not going to be able to do that today. But I think that that's probably a good option for journalists to, to maybe uh, venture. Yeah, I think it's worth, if y'all have not played around with IPFS and Filecoin, it's worth trying it out on Slate um, because it is really easy. It's this user interface you upload. For instance, I uploaded a picture. If you try to upload that picture a second time, it will not allow you to do it because it already exists. And so like the way that Filecoin works, right, is it is a content identifier. If that content is the same, you cannot create that content again. You would have to change it for it to create a new hash. Um, so yeah, yeah, that's, that's actually really exciting, and it just shows like the power of that particular piece. Yeah, it'll, it'll create a new content ID uh, on, the, on the chain so that um, there's a record of, of how um, this may look very similar, a very similar photograph, but maybe it was edited a little bit, or, the, or an article in Camila's case, right? Um, Bloomberg had uh, maybe the original kind of uh, version of the article, but then Camila left Bloomberg, and now she post uploaded her version of that article, and she, as the original creator, um, you know, it, it's it's going to be there on the and it, sort of. An, I guess you can call it an auto trail, right? Yeah. Where we can see that this is Camila's work. And then, Cami, I I wanted to end this session with you, just sort of talking about what it would take for, you know, in a in an environment where journalists are sort of overworked and sometimes underpaid, what it would take to get journalists and publishers in this space to really start using some of this technology. And I know you guys do use the technology, but IPFS and Filecoin. And yeah, um, I, I think it, it comes down to just how uh, easily it can be integrated into the publishing process, you know? Um, so in the case of the Defiant, it's journalists kind of have the, the task of obviously reporting and writing the story, 
and then editor set it up on WordPress and, and do like all the like logistics for the, the story to go out. So maybe part of that process could be, okay, the last step would be uh, adding that story to um, IPFS and Filecoin. And if that's, you know, if that takes like a couple of seconds extra for the editor to do, that wouldn't be an issue. The other thing to consider is cost. Like would uh, the client need to pay uh, on top of kind of all of our server costs and AWS and all of that, how much uh, would it cost to start storing uh, our stories on uh, on IPFS? So the, those two would be kind of the main uh, like considerations for me uh, to start kind of really integrating this on like my everyday or everyday process. Yeah, awesome. Well, I think we can end with that because that's basically a call out to all the builders. We need to like make those connections with journalists and publishers um, and also create those rails to make this easy and cost effective. Um, so yeah, thanks so much for your attention um, and we will be back shortly. Thank you.